All right, everybody, welcome to episode three of Hawk Droppings, uh, my podcast. Uh, one of three podcasts. Um, I'm going to do something interesting with the three podcasts this week, with Hawk Droppings, with Full Potato Friday, and with Hawk After Dark. Um, I spoke a little bit about this on my TikTok page. The magazine, The Atlantic, um, and this issue is it's available online on their website, at least. Uh, I don't know if uh, the hard copy print version has been released yet, but I imagine it will be soon. In their January, February edition, they dedicated the entire edition to what happens if Donald Trump wins a second term. And there are 24 essays from 24 of their best writers uh, on all different topics uh, that cover what happens if Donald Trump wins a second term. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break those 24 articles down into three groups of eight. And I'm going to do eight uh, of them starting at the beginning in, in this episode of Hawk Droppings. I'm going to do the second group of eight in this week's episode of Full Potato Friday. And I'm going to do the last group of eight in this week's uh, episode of Hawk After Dark. Um, it's a dark subject matter. It is not going to contain anything that is uplifting or happy. But I very, 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 very much appreciate the Atlantic uh, and and their their senior editor Jeffrey Goldberg doing this and their writers doing this because I do not think that the United States media, the American media, is talking enough about authoritarianism, Donald Trump's stated goal of authoritarianism and dictatorship, Project Twenty Twenty Five from the Heritage Foundation and what they want to do in a Trump administration to the executive branch and how all of those things are going to affect all of us on a daily basis for the next four years uh, and beyond if he is reelected. Okay, so I'm, I'm ready to go here. I have my uh, Cletus P. Twat Waffle mug from hawkmerchstore.com filled with a refreshing Coca-Cola. Um, so let's dive in. So I'm going to go through some of these articles. I'm going to start with the overview of the issue. It's a short article uh, from the editor, Jeffrey Goldberg, and it's entitled A Warning. The subtitle is America survived the first Trump term, though not without serious damage. A second term, if there is one, will be much worse. And he references... Uh, he references an article from 2018 in The Atlantic, um, which I referenced in one of my earlier episodes of, of one of these three podcasts. I don't remember which one. I think it was Hawk After Dark. Uh, in 2018, staff writer Adam Serwer wrote an article titled The Cruelty is the Point. And Adam Serwer started off that article and it was about the cruelty of Donald Trump and the cruelty of his supporters and the enjoyment that his supporters got out of being cruel to people on the left and people they don't like and people they disagree with, but how they enjoyed doing that as a group, as a community, and how being cruel formed the basis of that community for so many Trump supporters. And he started off that article... Um, by talking about, he had recently gone to, uh, I think it was the African American History Museum in Washington, D.C., and he had seen several photographs of lynchings, black and white photographs of lynchings. And one thing that drew his attention was not the horrifically mangled, burned, beaten, hanged bodies of African Americans, but the crowds of white people who were smiling uh, and who were smiling together because this is something that they had done as a community. And these people knew that their photographs were being taken and some of them were straining to get into the frame of the photograph 
Uh, it's a really good essay. You should read it. Adam Serwer, The Cruelty is the Point. And, and, and Jeffrey Goldberg kind of starts off by talking about, you know, what was some of our first exposures to Donald Trump as a candidate? And he talks about that quote that he said about John McCain, you know, it's like, he's not a war hero. I like, ca I like people who weren't captured. Okay. And everybody gasped across the country. Everybody gasped, everybody, it, it, every pundit, every media person, every elected Republican was just like, what? But Trump's base loved it because they hated John McCain. A and and he writes, I mainly couldn't understand his soul sickness, S-O-U-L. How could a person come to such a rotten, depraved thought? And I was like, ugh. And he talks about very early in the administration, he had lunch with Jared Kushner. I think it was at the White House. And, and Kushner agreed with, with Goldberg. He, he said, no one can go as low as the president. You shouldn't even try. And Jeffrey Goldberg was confused by that until he realized that Kushner was not insulting Donald Trump. He was paying him a compliment. Which I think tells you a good amount of what you need to know about Jared. I mean, when the hell are we going to investigate that little chode? And... And he goes on to talk about some of the, the language that Trump has used and how his language has evolved over time. And there was one, there was one, I'm just going to read this one paragraph. There was a time when it seemed impossible to imagine that Trump would once again be a candidate for president. That moment lasted from the night of January 6, 2021 until the afternoon of January 28th, 21, when then leader of the House Republican Caucus, Kevin McCarthy, visited Trump at Mar-a-Lago and welcomed him back into the fold. Thanks, Kevin. He went because Trump was depressed and was not eating. And we can't have that. And so he says of this issue, our team of brilliant writers makes a convincingly dispositive case that both Trump and Trumpism pose an existential threat to America in the ideas that animate it. The Atlantic, as our loyal readers know, is deliberately not a partisan magazine. Of no party or clique is our original 1857 motto, and that is true today. Our concern with Trump is not that he is a Republican or that he embraces, when convenient, certain conservative ideas. We believe that a democracy needs, among other things, a strong liberal party and a strong conservative party to flourish. Our concern is that the Republican Party has mortgaged itself to an anti-democratic demagogue and one who is completely devoid of decency. And I think that is an accurate statement. So the first actual essay that I want to talk about is written by a guy named David Frum. David Frum is someone who politically I disagree with on almost everything. I think he's a former Republican speechwriter uh, for George H.W. Bush or something like that. Uh, he's worked in some Republican administrations as a speechwriter. He is an absolutely brilliant writing. His write, writer, his writing is an absolute joy to read. It is always challenging for me uh, when I go through one of his articles with a highlighter. It's challenging for me not to highlight absolutely every single thing that he wrote down. Um, but I will try his article is in, in this edition is called the danger ahead. If Donald Trump returns to the white house, he'd better, he'd bring a better understanding of the system's vulnerabilities, more willing enablers, and a more focused agenda of retaliation against his adversaries. His second term is going to be about vengeance, punishment, and retribution. That's it. That's it. That's the entirety of, of his second term and ushering in autocracy. So I'm just going to read the first couple of paragraphs because it's just so well written. Um, For all its marvelous creativity, the human imagination often fails when turned to the future. It is blunted by perhaps by a craving for the familiar. 
We all appreciate that the past includes many moments of severe instability, crisis, even radical revolutionary upheaval. We know that such things happened years or decades a century or centuries ago. We cannot believe that they might happen tomorrow. When Donald Trump is the subject, the imagination falters even further. Trump operates so far outside the normal bounds of human behavior, never mind normal political behavior, that it is difficult to accept what he may actually do, even when he declares his intentions openly. And that's what he's doing right now. He's telling us openly what he's going to do. And we, I think it was, uh, maybe it was Ann Applebaum, uh, another writer for The Atlantic who I saw on MSNBC. She's like, we're sleepwalking into a dictatorship because it's a failure of our imagination to think that it might happen tomorrow in this country. And yeah. Uh, in his first term, Trump's corruption and brutality were mitigated by his ignorance and laziness. Is that not just a perfect sentence? In, in, in a second term, Trump would arrive with a much better understanding. That was the subtitle. When people wonder what another Trump term might hold, their minds underestimate the chaos that would lie ahead. By election day 2024, Donald Trump will be in the thick of multiple criminal trials. It's not, possi it's not impossible that he may already have been convicted in at least one of them. If he wins election, Trump will commit the first crime of his second term at noon on Inauguration Day because his oath to defend the Constitution of the United States will be perjury. The dude can write. This is what I'm saying. And that is spot on, man. He's going to take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States, and then he's going to go destroy the rule of law to save his own ass. A second Trump term would instantly plunge the country into a constitutional crisis more terrible than anything seen since the Civil War. The government cannot function with an indicted or convicted criminal at its head. The president would be an outlaw or on his way to becoming an outlaw for his own survival. He would have to destroy the rule of law. So, and then he runs through like five things that he would have to, or likely do in that regard, all of which are un-American. Stop all federal cases against Trump, criminal and civil pardon and protect all of those who tried to overturn the 2020 election on Trump's behalf or who've pled guilty. In, in the criminal cases thus far at the federal level. Send the Department of Justice into action against Trump adversaries and, credit and critics and the independence of the civil service and fire of federal officials who refuse to carry out Trump's commands. That is Project 2025. Firing over 50,000 federal civil service workers, career people at federal departments and agencies across the board and replacing all of those 50,000 people with Donald Trump loyalists, 50,000 Stephen Millers, 50,000 Steve Bannons. Five, if these lawless actions ignite protests in American cities, order the military to crush them. If a president can pardon himself for federal crimes as Trump would likely do, then he would, he could write, his pardon in advance and shoot visitors to the white house. And this is on point with the presidential immunity stuff that the Supreme court just today agreed to hear for that matter. The vice president could murder the president in the oval office and then immediately pardon herself right after she's sworn in. <laughs> oh God. In his first term, he wanted to withdraw from NATO Second term, he would choose aides who would not talk him out of it. I mean, the United States would be too paralyzed by troubles at home to help our friends abroad. And imagine this. Imagine that it's like 2016, that Trump wins the Electoral College, fails to win the popular vote, gets sworn in, and after not winning a majority support of the United States voters, institutes some form of autocracy anyway. 
Imagine Trump has won the Electoral College with 46% of the vote because third-party candidates funded by Republican donors successfully splintered the left. Having failed to win the popular vote in each of the past three elections, Trump becomes the president for the second time. On that thin basis, his supporters would try to execute his schemes of personal impunity and political vengeance. He... Project 2025 spreads itself out over the entire executive branch. Donald Trump doesn't give two shits about the entirety of the executive branch. He cares about the Department of Justice. That's it. Department of Justice, and within that, the FBI. That's what he cares about. If a president can summon investigation of his opponents or summon the military to put down protests, then suddenly our society would no longer be free. It has always been Trump's supreme political wish to wield both the law and institutional violence as political weapons of power, a wish that many in his party now seem determined to help him achieve. And his party has been going further and further and further right on this stuff over the last six years. And he closes out with this, which is one of my all-time favorite founding father quotes, whatever. Um, When Benjamin Franklin famously said of the then new constitution, a republic, if you can keep it, And for all you potatoes, a republic is a form of democracy. A constitutional republic is a form of democracy. Right. So when you say we're not a democracy, we're a constitutional republic, that's like pointing at a German shepherd and saying, I don't have a dog, I have a German shepherd. That's how dumb you sound when you say that. Okay. Um. When he says a republic, if you can keep it, Franklin was not suggesting that the republic might be misplaced absentmindedly. He foresaw that ambitious, ruthless characters would arise to try to break the republic and that weak, venal characters might assist them. So he imagined Donald Trump. And that's what he was talking about Donald Trump when he said when he said that quote. Okay. So now let's start talking about how Donald Trump's going to get this done. The next article that I want to talk about is by a guy named McKay Coppins. It's called Loyalists, Lapdogs, and Cronies. McKay Coppins is also an absolutely fantastic writer, and he is the guy who wrote uh, the just-published biography of Mitt Romney. Uh, That book contains some absolutely wonderful prose, uh, and this is one of my favorite things about The Atlantic. They don't just hire people um, who are good thinkers. They hire people who are good writers. Hang on. I'm just checking my levels here. I'm going to turn that up just a little bit. Okay. There we go. Um, they hire such incredibly good writers. And, and McKay Coppins is one of those. And the subtitle of this article, Loyalist Lapdogs and Cronies, sums up the entire article in a second Trump term, there would be no adults in the room. Remember about his first term. It's like, yeah, Trump hired Steve Bannon as a senior advisor. He hired Mike general, Mike Flynn, uh, you know, as his national intelligence guy, but there was James Mattis decorated four-star general uh, who took over DOD, Gary Cohn, the Goldman Sachs guy who took over uh, national economic council, Rex Tillerson was the CEO uh, who came in as Secretary of State. He had relationships all around the world. There were some arguably serious people, uh, even if you disagreed with them. There were some adults in the room that, you know, and part of it, part of it was a a fame thing, you know, kind of a star fucker quality that Trump had because he was positively giddy that all of these very important people were suddenly willing to work for him when if he weren't president, they would be laughing at him and they wouldn't talk to him and they would be making fun of him. But now that he's president, they came to work for him. He enjoyed that. Uh, A consensus had formed that what the incoming administration needed most was adults in the room. And that's what these people were. That's what they consisted of. Now, that's not going to happen a second time because a lot of those adults in the room 
were the ones who constrained him from doing the things that he wanted to do throughout the course of his presidency. And, and I think that's kind of summed up, you know, this past summer, NBC news reported that just four of the 44 people who had served as cabinet secretaries, excuse me, during Trump's first administration, only four of them are endorsing him for president in 2024. And, you know, it's like, even it, because most and, and and most mainstream Republicans don't even want to work for Trump in a second term. And even if they did, Trump is unlikely to want them in a second term because those are the kinds of people who constrained him in his first term. And part of this whole Project 2025 thing, which is actively in play right now, is Trump's team and other organizations that support Trump are out in the United States right now. They're finding those 50,000 people to replace the civil servants that are going to get fired. They're scouring people's social media. They're making sure that they are sufficiently Trumpy to come into a second administration and ram through whatever Trump tells them to do. And that will also apply to people who serve in his cabinet. He wants those kinds of people in his cabinet. He wants a cabinet that consists of people like Steve Bannon and Stephen Miller and Cash Patel. It, you know, it, it it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, Stephen Miller, you know, was with Trump throughout the whole administration, and they were in perfect alignment on one single issue, immigration. And it's rumored that Stephen Miller could become the attorney general. Or that he could become head of ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Or even the Secretary of Homeland Security, which would oversee 17 different agencies in our entire intelligence apparatus. I'm sure that would be fine. Um, God, for Secretary of State, one likely candidate is a guy named Richard Grinnell. G-R-E-N-E-L-L. -L. Google him. Richard Grinnell is a Trump troll whack job. He is insane. Trump made him ambassador to Germany, and he went over there and acted like a MAGA bull in a China shop. And, and the Germans were just like, what the hell is this guy doing? And Trump loved it. Trump thought it was super entertaining. Yeah. Okay. He wants to make Trump Grinnell secretary of state or whatever his first name is, Richard Grinnell. And, but the one, the one agency, the one department that Trump cares about is DOJ department of justice. And there's a guy named Paul Dans who worked in the Trump administration in the office of personnel management and is now one of the two guys in charge of Project 2025 at the Heritage Foundation. And he said, the notion of the so-called independence of the Department of Justice needs to be consigned to the ash heap of history. He and Trump believe that the Department of Justice, the FBI, should take orders directly from the president as to who to investigate and who to prosecute, which is literally third world banana republic shit. It just is. That's the kind of thing that happens under dictators around the world. And that's what Trump and the Heritage Foundation and Republicans want for the United States. Cletus disagrees. He's also going to put Vivek Ramaswamy in his cabinet. <laughs> he might even make him vice president. Whatever. Um, you know... It's so those are the kinds of people that are going to be in the second administration and it's not going to go well. Okay. I'm just telling you. And so next up, we've got an article by a guy named David Graham called Trump isn't bluffing. We've become inured to his rhetoric, but his message has grown darker. So this is about the normalization of political violence through Trump's rhetoric and how his rhetoric has evolved 
uh, over the last few years. And, and he starts off with that quote that we heard uh, from one of his recent campaign speeches. We pledge to you that we will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country that lie and steal and cheat on elections. The real threat is not from the radical right. The real threat is from the radical left. The threat from outside forces is far less sinister, dangerous, and grave than the threat from within. Our threat is from within. All of that is about other Americans. It's not about China. It's not about North Korea. It's not about Iran. That rhetoric is what he is saying now today about other Americans. What immediately leaps out here is the word vermin with its echoes of Hitler and Mussolini. He's appearing to promise a purge or a repression of those who disagree with him politically. So in 2016, he was just railing on immigrants, telling, you know, lock her up and all of that stuff, you know, support for protectionism. But today, Trump is different. His fury over his 2020 election defeat, the legal cases against him, and a desire for re revenge against political opponents have come to eclipse everything else. He has no policies. He's not campaigning on any policies. He's campaigning very explicitly on, I'm going to take over the Department of Justice and put everyone who doesn't like me in prison. That's what he's campaigning on. And his crowds go wild. He's now describing himself as a very proud election denier. He keeps threatening and intimidating judges, witnesses, prosecutors, and their families involved in the cases against him. He's going to put <laughs> he's going to put his opponents in mental asylums if he's reelected. He wants former Joint Chief of Staff to, to be executed on grounds of treason, and he's called for investigating NBC and possibly yanking the network off of the air uh, because they said mean things about him. And he's vowed to arrest and indict President Joe Biden and other political opponents for no apparent reason other than that they oppose him. The fact that Trump's ideas become more authoritarian is not yet fully appreciated. And that's what I was talking about um, when I said the American media is completely failing, all of us right now, currently. And by, by saying these things over and over and over again, the first time he says it, it's shocking. And we all go, what the hell did he just say? And the second time, it barely makes news. And the third time, we're just like, oh, is he still talking about that? Is he still talking about that? He, you know, so he's, he's just like, he's getting us used to it. He's getting us used to it where it's not shocking anymore. So how's, how else is he going to get away with it? Um, one of my absolute favorite writers for The Atlantic for several years, a guy named Barton Gelman, G-E-L-L-M-A-N. He has written some absolutely fantastic essays over the last five or six years. Uh, and this one's called How Trump Gets Away With It. Um, and it talks about all the things that he tried to do in his first administration which he was not able to do because of some of these adults in the room. But he, he makes, he makes a couple of really crucial points. All of these cabinet level positions are going to have to be confirmed by the Senate. And if you remember towards the end of Trump's last term, he had gotten rid of many of those people who needed to be Senate confirmed. And he had an acting defense secretary. He had an acting attorney general. He had an acting deputy uh, attorney general. He, he had all of these people in these acting positions. He had stuck Cash Patel in an acting position at the DOD. Uh, he, he had an acting secretary of defense and, you know, who hadn't been confirmed by the Senate yet. And you know, those people are only allowed to serve for a certain period of time. But as it relates to the top jobs at the DOJ, there's a Vacancies Reform Act, which I'd never heard of. 
Under that act, which regulates temporary appointments, Trump can appoint any currently serving Senate confirmed official from anywhere in the executive branch as acting attorney general, provided they meet some certain requirements. And and there was, uh, uh, Gelman quotes, a uh, Stanford law professor, uh, Ann Joseph O'Connell. She's an expert on the Vacancies Reform Act. She's like, this is how we got Matthew Whitaker as an acting attorney general under Trump. Matthew Whitaker is one of my absolute favorite Trump people, and I say that completely sarcastically and facetiously. Before he do- he joined the DOJ, uh, he ran this company that like did inventions or some shit or bought people's inventions. And Matthew Whitaker is the guy who patented what became known as the big dick toilet. I'm not kidding. It was a special toilet with a very deep bowl to accommodate very well endowed men. The big dick toilet brought to you by acting attorney general under Donald Trump, Matthew Whitaker. You can Google that. I swear to God, it's real. You can Google it and it brings up drawings. <laughs> I'm not joking. I swear to God. <laughs> but, you know, so with that information in mind and knowing that Donald Trump, his first priority on coming into office on inauguration day on of his second term, his first first task is to get him out from under these 91 felony indictments uh, and the criminal cases that are pending and who knows what with regard to if he's been convicted in the January 6th case. So, you know, are there some career officials that meet these career or meet these criteria that would allow Trump to make them an acting attorney general on day one who are sufficiently loyal to him who would carry these things out? Trump's team is looking right now across the entire executive branch for people who fit that category. They are planning and looking right now for that person or persons. And so to start off, he could just fire special counsel Jack Smith. There is a requirement that uh, a president cannot fire a special counsel arbitrarily he can only be removed for misconduct, dereliction of duty, incapacity, conflict of interest, or for other good cause. That last clause is a catch-all that Trump would readily invoke. I mean, yeah. So, but even if he fired Smith, that would leave the investigations or the convictions intact. Uh, no law would prevent Trump from ordering the DOJ that they drop ongoing investigations into him or stop pursuing further prosecutions of him, or if he's already been convicted in a case, to tell the appellate court, we're not pursuing this case anymore, we no longer wish to support this conviction, and ask the appellate court to vacate that conviction. That's what Bill Barr did with a disgraced National Security Advisor General Mike Flynn, who had pled guilty. He had pled guilty twice to felonies. And then he appealed that. And when Bill Barr became attorney general, he's like, yeah, appellate court, we're not, we don't support this conviction anymore. We're not pursuing uh, jail time. We're not pursuing anything. And we'd like you to vacate this conviction. Yeah. There's precedent for that. Cool. And then we get to, you know, is Trump going to pardon himself? Yeah, it's never been done before. Uh, There's no law against it. There's a memo from 1974 from the Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel that a self-pardon would be invalid under the fundamental rule that no one may be a judge in his own case. Okay, who's going to enforce that? Right, nobody. And if anybody were to enforce it, it would be enforced by the Department of Justice, which Trump would have already taken control of. So, yeah. So now, how would that affect the prosecutions in Fulton County, Georgia, uh, the RICO case with Fonnie Willis, and 
the Manhattan case with uh, DA Alvin Bragg. Well, if he's reelected, again, there are two DOJ uh, Office of Legal Counsel opinions. They're not law. They're not binding. But the indictment or criminal prosecution of a sitting president would unconstitutionally undermine the capacity of the executive branch to perform its constitutionally assigned functions. State prosecutors are not obligated to follow that. But I think in practical terms, it would make it impossible for those cases to proceed while he is president. And and if he's reelected, then we're talking what they're going to process. They're going to start those trials back up eight years after the original offenses took place. I don't know. Um, yeah. So that's some of the ways that he gets away with some of this stuff. Now, piggybacking on that. Um, normalization of political violence and rhetoric. There's another columnist uh, named Juliet Kayam who wrote an article called The Proud Boys Love a Winner. <laughs> oh, God, a second Trump term would validate the violent ideologies of far right extremists and allow them to escape legal jeopardy. So Juliet Kayam, she is a CNN commentator, I believe. She's former CIA uh, and is extremely smart about these kinds of things, about international terrorism and domestic terrorism. Um, and just think about all the January 6 people, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, uh, the, the ones, the, the, the boots on the ground people who've been convicted and have gone to jail. Trump's going to pardon every single one of those people, man. He's going to pardon every single one of those people if he gets reelected. And then he will have at least two private militias, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. And he had just pardoned all of their senior leadership and every member of those organizations who'd gone to prison for trying to keep him in office on January 6th. And there is nothing that Donald Trump gets off on more than watching other people commit violence on his behalf. That. I think he likes that more than sex. I just, I do. Uh, I don't have anything factual to base that on. <laughs> I just know that that's true um, because he is such a malignant narcissist and a profoundly disordered human being. So but she talks about something that I think is important. Um, Trump has mastered a form of radicalization, sometimes known as stochastic terrorism. Riling up his followers in a way that made bloodshed likely while preserving plausible deniability on his part. It, it's the, it's his language. It's his language from his January 6th speech at the ellipse. March down to the Capitol and protest peacefully. If you don't fight like hell, we don't, again, we're not going to have a country anymore. You know, be there will be wild at the January 6th rally. And it, you know, it's mob talk. It's it's mob boss talk, basically, is what it is. All right, we've hit the point in the podcast where we're going to rotate to Coca-Cola number two. And I've conveniently poured that into my full potato Friday mug, which you can get at hawkmerchstore.com. All right, thank you. This episode is brought to you by hawkmerchstore.com, which is also me, which, you know, means that the sponsorship fees don't really pay that well. Um, so he's going to pardon all of these guys. Whether or not they'll still be open to state prosecution at that point, you know, if we're talking about statutes of limitations and things like that, I don't know. Um, but, you know, she talks to a Harvard, a Harvard professor who studies political violence named Erica Chenoweth. The extremism won't be some side group like the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys. It won't be like a terror group against the state. The conditions will be different. It will be embedded into state institutions, state meaning federal, and into the orientation of the state against perceived opponents. What is clear 
is that a restored Trump would have a winning narrative in which right-wing extremism, after suffering some legal setbacks during the Biden administration, thrives again. So it's like he would come in, he would pardon all of these guys, which would communicate to all of them, you guys can do whatever the hell you want to as long as it's on my behalf. And if you are violent on my behalf, you will not be prosecuted by my Department of Justice. The big loophole there being state prosecutions, and um, which is a pretty big loophole. Um, but, you know, so uh, there's another great writer there, a guy named Mark Leibovich. And this kind of tails onto that one a little bit. He's written some really good books about D.C. Um, and the culture of Washington, D.C. And and his his article in this uh, edition is like, you know, what is the impact of this on American culture? And, and it's called Trump voters are America too. If he wins a second term, perhaps we will finally dispense with the myth that this is not who we are. And he starts this off great by some of the, uh, you know, kind of soaring high-minded rhetoric of uh, the Obama years. And... You know, during the spring of 2016, Michelle Obama was delivering her final commencement address as first lady at City College of New York. And, you know, Trump was already running. I think he had already clinched the campaign by that or clinched the nomination by that point or was close to it. And she was kind of talking about that a little bit. And she said, this is not who we are. That is not what this country stands for. That promise did not age well. Not that November and not since. This is not who we are. (laughs) Well, who is we anyway? Because it sure seems like lots of this we keep voting for Trump. And Trump got 74 million votes in 2020. He got more votes than any other incumbent president in the history of the United States. And fortunately, Joe Biden got 81 million votes. But, and okay, and I always harp about this. Joe Biden got more than 7 million more votes than Donald Trump, but 5 million of those votes came from California and 2 million of them came from New York. So you can throw those out. Joe Biden was elected by less than 45,000 votes across Wisconsin, Georgia, and Arizona. If those three states had flipped Trump less than 45,000 votes, Trump would have been reelected. So Joe Biden did not win by 7 million votes. Okay, but that's an aside. Um and so the point, the point of, Mar- of, of, of Leibovich's article, it's like 74 million people voted for this guy after witnessing his first term, after seeing what he did during his first term, 74 million people still voted for this chucklehead. So maybe this is who we are, or at least tens of millions of us. We are not so high minded as a country as to say, oh, that's that's not who we are as the United States of America. That's just not who we are. Bullshit. That's exactly who we are. Um, and, you know, and he goes on to say, you know, it's like when they go low, we go high and we are the ones we've been waiting for and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it's just met with a chorus of screams from the inbred howler monkey gomer maggot shuds of lock her up and you know it is who we are at least in part the united states is not above these people and part of the way part of the reason why these people became the way they did with trump and why they love trump is because they felt looked down on by everyone else on the left and everyone else in the GOP establishment. They were the forgotten man and the forgotten woman. And they felt disrespected. They felt insignificant. They felt unincluded. They felt like they were not considered. And so when Donald Trump came along and started speaking directly to them, they were like, that's our guy. That's our guy. You ask him about his policies. They don't know a goddamn thing about his policies. He speaks for us. He speaks for us. That's our guy. 
And that's one of the reasons why they're so dedicated to him is because they perceive him as being so dedicated to them and speaking on their behalf and speaking up for them when everybody else views them as less than. Crazy. And this, here we go. When the political elites insisted we're better than this, a close cousin of this is not who we are, many did, many Trump disciples heard we're better than them. We are better than these people. Hillary Clinton ably confirmed this when she dismissed half of the Republican nominee's supporters as people who held views that were racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. And then she went on to call them deplorables. Uh, whether or not she was correct, the targets of her judgment did not appreciate what she had to say. And the disdain was mutual. Quote, he's our murder weapon, unquote, said the conservative political scientist Charles Murray, summarizing the appeal that Trump held for many of his loyalists. He is our murder weapon. You can dismiss Trump voters all you want, but give them this. They are every bit as American as any idealized vision of the place. If Trump wins in 2024, his detractors will have to reckon once again with the voters who got us here to reconcile what it means to share a country with so many citizens who keep watching Trump spiral deeper into his moral void and still conclude, yes, that's our guy. He's our murder weapon. They're just as American as we are, even if they don't know the difference between there, there, and there, or two, two, and two, or then and than, or lose and loose. <laughs> I could go on forever, but you know, whatever. All right. So the last article we're going to talk about today is by a columnist named Jennifer Senior. What will happen to the American psyche if Trump is reelected? Our bodies are not designed to handle chronic stress? And the answer is drugs. We have to start using drugs. No, I'm kidding. Um, she opens this up great. Uh, there were times during the first two years of the Biden presidency when I came close to forgetting about all of it. The taunts and provocations, the incitements and, resist and resentments, the disorchestrated reasoning, the verbal incontinence, the press conferences fueled by megalomania, vengeance, hydroxychloroquine, and ivermectin. I forgot almost that we'd had a man in the White House who was governed by tweet. I forgot that the news cycle had shrunk down to microseconds. I forgot even that we'd had a president with a personality so disordered and a mind so dysregulated that the generals around him had to choose between carrying out presidential orders and upholding the Constitution. Say what you want about Joe Biden. He has allowed us to go days at a time without remembering that he's even there. <laughs> but here we are, faced with the prospect of a Trump restoration. What will happen to the American psyche if he wins? What will happen if we have to live in fight or flight mode for four more years and possibly beyond? Oh, God. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, okay. Our bodies are not designed to handle chronic stress. Neuroscientists have a term for the tipping point moment when we capitulate to it. Allostatic overload. <laughs> and the result is almost always sickness in one form or another whether it's a mood disorder, substance abuse, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, or ulcers. Increase your blood pressure for a few minutes to get to evade a lion. That's a good thing. Increase your blood pressure every time you're in the vicinity of someone like Trump and you begin to get cardiovascular degrees or disease. Uh, excess levels of the stress hormone cortisol for extended periods is terrible for the human body. It hurts the immune system in ways that, among other things, can lead to worse outcomes for COVID and other diseases. Great. Okay. So, yeah. <sighs> 
you know, and but this feeds this feeds directly into authoritarianism and what an authoritarian ruler needs. Because it's like after so many years of this level of stress, millions of people are just gonna kind of give up and curl up in a little ball and just wait for it to be over. <laughs> One clinical psychiatrist wonders if a second Trump term would be like a second paralyzing blow in boxing, translating to a learned helplessness on a population level scale in which a substantial portion of us (laughs) curdle into listlessness and despair, which is what a would-be authoritarian wants, a republic of the indifferent. Here's the flip side. The Trump base will be intoxicated. We should brace ourselves for a second uncorking of what Philip Roth called the indigenous, excuse me, (laughs) the indigenous American berserk. (laughs) The Proud Boys will be prouder. The Alex Jones conspiracists will let their false flag freakishness fly. That was very hard to say. The great replacement theorists will become more savage in their rhetoric about black, Hispanic, and Jewish people. They will get worse. But at this point, even an electric... Okay, here's a really good point. Here's a really good point. If Joe Biden wins re-election in 2024, it doesn't mean these people are going to go away. It doesn't mean they're all going to just wake up and change their minds. It doesn't mean that all of this just stops. It just means that they're not going to be in power for four years. But at this point, even an electoral defeat for Trump might not significantly diminish the toll that politics is taking on the collective American psyche. In such a polarized society, everyone is always living with a lot of hate, fear, and suspicion. Uh, says Rebecca Sachs, a neuroscientist at MIT who thinks a good deal about tribalism. (laughs) The winner of the next presidential election may change who bears the burden every four or eight years, but not the burden itself. Um, You get Trump at once, it's it's misfortune. You get him twice, it's normal, and it's what the country is. Uh, okay. So, you know, I'm sorry to be such a Debbie Downer on this shit, but I think it's extremely important that we talk about it and that we talk about it for what it is. Uh, and what it is, what Trump is, is an existential threat to the United States continuing as a democratically governed constitutional Republic with norms, with a DOJ that is not taking orders directly from a president about who to prosecute and who to put in jail And we don't replace 50,000 people across every federal department and agency with people like Stephen Miller and Steve Bannon. It. I'm not even going to talk about for who at this point, I'm just going to start off with by saying everybody, please register to vote and everybody please vote in 2024. We'll get to the for who part later on after the war in the Gaza Strip is over. (laughs) And, you know, everybody can beat the shit out of Joe Biden for that. But Joe Biden is going to be the Democratic nominee. Donald Trump is going to be the Republican nominee. So that is going to be our choice. Are we going to vote for Joe Biden and continue as a democratically governed constitutional republic? Or are we going to vote for Donald Trump or stay home and let Donald Trump win and have all of those happy, fun things that I just described, which will negatively affect every single fucking person in this country who doesn't wake up in the morning and put on a MAGA hat, which I'm going to go out on a limb and say everybody who's listening to this podcast. So thank you for joining me again this evening. Thank you to everyone who followed me over here from TikTok and YouTube. Uh, Again, you can get your full potato Friday mugs, and your Cletus P. Twat Waffle mugs at hawkmerchstore.com. As always, huge thank you to my brother Falcon for setting up that store and my buddy Wiseacre uh, for doing an incredible job with the graphics that he did. Um, And I will see you next time. All right, go outside and do something fun after listening to this. Please go for a walk, play with your dog, do something, 
to take your mind off of this for a little bit, but don't forget anything that I said. All right. I'll see you next time.